I'm now pleased to introduce our first presenter, David Hornick. He is an investment professional at August Capital. David Hornick has worked with technology startups in the software sector for more than a decade. In 2000, Mr. Hornick joined August Capital to invest broadly in information technology companies with a focus on enterprise application and infrastructure software, as well as consumer-facing software and services. It is now ple my pleasure to introduce David Hornick, and he will present the first briefing on private funding as a financing option to commercializing technology. All right. Good morning. Uh, glad to be here, and thank you for having me. As, a, as you heard, I'm a... I, my name is David Hornick. I'm an, uh, a venture capitalist with August Capital. And uh, before that, I was an attorney and represented lots of small businesses. So I've had, uh, as well as uh, some pretty large businesses. So I've had the good pleasure of uh, being on all sides of this business. Uh, came to it having been, uh, having worked more uh, with the entrepreneurs and on the entrepreneurial side than having been a representative of the venture capital side. And so uh, I've seen it from the side of the, of the folks who are trying to raise money, trying to build businesses, as well as uh, as an investor in those companies. And I, I will say one of the great things about being uh, an early stage venture capitalist is that as soon as I've invested in any given company, it really is my opportunity to uh, to, to be on the same side as the entrepreneur, we have the same aligned interests, and the and the and the goal is to grow the business to be uh, big and meaningful. Uh, so maybe we can go to the next slide. And so I, I'm going to just try and very briefly go through the question of uh, fundraising. Is you know, uh, is it is it something that uh, that you should consider at all? Uh, if so, from whom is is uh, is it the best? You know, who is your best source of capital, and uh, what does it take to raise that money? And then, if I do raise it, what what's the trade-off? There, you know, there there are obviously trade-offs in every instance uh, when you are selling shares in your company, and and so what is that um, what is that trade-off? So that's sort of I'll quickly run through that, and then happy to answer any questions. So next slide. So I think it's interesting. Uh, Obviously, there are people on this call from um, from all over the country. I live in Palo Alto, California. I literally could throw a rock out my window here and hit Stanford's campus. And there's a real bias, I would say, around here towards the idea of raising venture capital. Uh, venture capital is really just a, a group of people who have raised lots of money and we, we invested in, in early stage startups. Uh, we buy a piece of your company. And we hope that uh, hope that we can help you build a business, make it bigger. Uh, there's lots of excitement today about uh, the coming Facebook IPO, and uh, that will go down in history. Facebook will go down in history as the most successful venture investment uh, ever. Uh, venture investors in that company invested uh, when the company was quite small, dozens of people, uh, and at a valuation. Uh, in the range of about a hundred million dollars, and the company is now uh, f filed to go public at about a hundred billion dollars. And so, the venture industry is one in which uh, you you hope for outcomes like that, funding uh, funding small companies that have the opportunity to be transformative. But I will say that here in Silicon Valley, there's a real bias uh, towards venture capital, towards this idea that if you're building a business and it's going to be a meaningful business, then uh, it will require that you raise venture capital. Come and visit me in my office, and you know if you're serious about building a business, then you're gonna you're gonna look to raise millions of dollars. And I have to say that I actually don't I don't share that bias. I mean, obviously, I'm more than happy to meet with lots of interesting companies and and uh, talk with them about financing. But the reality is that there have been lots of very successful, valuable businesses that have been built over time without venture capital. And, uh, and, and as I'll discuss later on, venture capital comes at a cost. That cost is at a, ver at a minimum that you're selling a piece of your company. And so if, in fact, you could build a business without raising venture capital, then um, in many ways that's the, that's the preferred path. You, uh, you end up owning 100% of your business, not 80% of your business or 60% of your business. Uh, but it's hard, right? The reality is that uh, the lifeblood of all startups uh, is money. Uh, companies uh, 
can run out of all sorts of things and still and still survive, but they cannot run out of money. And uh, and there are very few businesses that can uh, get started on a small amount of money and then start generating sufficient money to grow in a in, uh, at a pace that makes sense, etc. So um, so I think of uh, venture capital or or angel investing as the opportunity to accelerate your business uh, without you know, without the need to use cash flow, uh, which is which is really hard, and and oftentimes uh, the the investment from venture investors allows you to make certain bets that will that will move your business along more significantly than uh, than if you were just building it on contracts or or revenue, etc. So, um, so with that said, maybe the next slide. So if you if you do decide, you know, uh, you've gotten a business started, you started on a you know small amount of savings or you've, you've put put stuff on your credit cards or whatever the process uh, and you think there's an opportunity to build something bigger um, and then then where do you go where do you go to raise raise this capital what does that look like uh, etc um, and I think that you know again I think it's important to note that uh, that you know capital is should be viewed as leverage right that Money raising money is not in and of itself success. Raising money in an, is not uh, is is in fact not an outcome. Uh, it is a it is a means to an end. My raising venture capital uh, while creating some validation and those sorts of things in the end is really just about uh, allowing you to make certain bets in your business that uh, uh, that will help you help you move the business forward in a meaningful way. I remember uh, hearing someone speak uh, shortly after 2008 when the economy had collapsed and people were talking about how loans were, um, you know, that, that, that borrowing money was a terrible idea and that uh, borrowing money was, uh, was sort of uh, evil. And, uh, and someone was speaking and, and said, you know, the, the really this is the wrong message, that, uh, that, that money is not, whether whether it's borrowing it or raising it, the money is not the problem. The you know that what people have to realize is that money come money comes at an expense, but it also can be an accelerator. And so in this instance, I think that's the question that everybody has to ask themselves. I have a business. I'm running it with myself. You know, maybe another person, um, and we don't have the capacity to do a set of things. Maybe it is to buy the technology we need to build whatever it is we're, we're building. So you've designed something, but you can't build it without additional capital. Maybe it's that you, uh, that you as the founder are always busy selling and you could sell a lot more if you had two or three more of you out there, et cetera. So I think you have to look to yourself and say, what, are, you know, what leverage will this money give me? Will it allow me to hire more technologists? Will it allow me to hire more salespeople? Will it allow me to Buy more advertisements, etc. <clears throat> Excuse me, and will that you know, and will that uh, have a meaningful impact on my business? And 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 the other thing that I'd say is that the very best way to measure it is that when you raise money, uh, it always is is to sell some piece of your business. So let's say you're raising a million dollars and you're going to sell 25 percent of your business. So someone comes in and buys a quarter of the company for a million dollars. What you need to ask yourself is, after I have uh, used this million dollars, invested this million dollars in my business through technology or salespeople or whatever, do I think that my I will have increased the value of my business by more than 25%? Right? And if the answer is yes, then that's probably a reasonable thing to do. Yes, I can use this money to accelerate my business in a way where suddenly it's worth, uh, you know, it was worth a million dollars, now it's worth two. Well, hey, spending, you know, 25% of the ownership in the company to double its value, that's probably a pretty good use of, uh, pretty good use of capital. So, um, so who do you buy, uh, who do you raise money from? If you, if you've come to this conclusion, you've decided, yes, I've got this opportunity and I want to build a bigger business. Um, and I just need to figure out how to, uh, how to raise money. Well, you know, there, there are sort of a range of, uh, of investment opportunities. Obviously, uh, you can go to a bank and you can have a conversation. I have to say that banks tend to be quite bad at uh, what, what I'd call risk capital. This idea that they're going to make an investment in something that's quite risky and then uh, and hopefully it will pay off disproportionately. So banks are usually a bad um, lender. They're looking for security. They're looking for all sorts of things that in all likelihood you don't have. If you had it, you wouldn't uh, need to come to them. Um, 
So then there's a, and there are a range of uh, early stage investors. Uh, the traditional version is what we call friends and family. We often when, when you're raising money early, it's called the friends and family round. And, um, and friends and family is precisely as it sounds. It is the idea that you go out to your family, your friends, the, you know, the friends of your family and the family of your friends, and explain to them your business and, and, uh, and raise a relatively small amount of money from those people. Right, and uh, you know the the upside is that oftentimes you're able to raise money based on the relationships that you have. So you can go out and you get the benefit of the doubt because this is someone who either has known you since birth or has been a close friend of you or your family for some period of time, and and um, and knows a lot about you and is willing to to make a bet on you. And frankly, you know. Uh, investment in these sorts of businesses is almost always a personal matter, right? It's, uh, it is very rare that someone presents a piece of technology or an, a market opportunity and people go, well, I don't really care who's running this thing. It's such a good business. I should definitely put money in. It's almost always, you know, hey, that David Hornick came in and presented a really compelling business and I think he can make me a lot of money. So when you already have a relationship with someone, then you can really drive that business forward. Uh, drive that relationship forward more quickly, can get to an answer more quickly. So friends and family is just a shortcut which says, I'm going to go out to the people who know me best and I'm going to say, hey, you know what, do me a favor and bet on me. I'm going to raise $100,000 or something. It's very rare that fr a friends and family uh, investment looks like an angel investment or a venture capital investment in the millions of dollars, right? You had a, you'd have to have very wealthy friends and very wealthy family to get to that kind of money. But it is a good way to get started, and depending on the scale of your business, what you're trying to do, um, you know, going out to p the people who know you best is a perfectly reasonable way to get started. With one caveat, which is, you know, uh, it is a tricky thing to work with friends and family, and uh, and most of these sorts of businesses uh, where you're super early stage, you're just getting off the ground, are very speculative. And so, what I always say with respect to friends and family or angel investments. Um, it is certainly the case with venture capital is that you can't, you should not be making an investment in which you cannot afford to lose all of your money, right? Uh, and that your expectation going in is that, or, the, or your investor's expectation going in should be that, hey, uh, I like David and I think he's a good guy and I would love to support him and I'm hopeful that he builds, builds a big business, but in all likelihood David will fail and I will lose this $25,000, but I can afford to make that bet because if he doesn't fail, then it'll be worth a lot more. And if he and if he does, I have enough money to you know continue with my retirement or whatever. So, um, so I would say you know be very careful not to take money the last dollar from people. It's just not a it's not a good plan. But if you can convince friends and family who haven't have money that's available to to help you get your business off the ground, then great. Um, if you don't happen to have those friends or those rich friends or those rich family. Then there's a class of people called angel investors, angels, and uh, and they are out there to take the place of friends and family for businesses that seem compelling, uh, with founders who seem compelling, and uh, and and they can really uh, accelerate your business again. They're more likely to have a uh, million dollars than a hundred thousand uh, dollars, and and they have and they and their process is is quicker than venture capital. It's easier, etc. So. So, um, so angel investment, and uh, and 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 there it turns out there are angel investors all over the country. They're certainly concentrated in the kind of startup hubs like Silicon Valley or Boston or New York or Austin, Texas or Chicago, etc. Um, but there are in every in in every state in this country there are people who are who call themselves angel investors. And those angel investors in Silicon Valley they tend to be people who were successful before. They were in startups. They managed to build those startups into a big business. They made a fair amount of money and then they took that money and they invested it in uh, they invested in future startups. So for example, Reed Hoffman, who was the founder of uh, LinkedIn, before that he was a senior executive at, uh, at PayPal and he made a reasonable amount of money in the process of taking PayPal public and then selling it to eBay. Uh, and then he decided that, given that he had this money, that the best use of it that he could think of would be to uh, to invest in other startups. And so he did that, and he actually did quite well. He uh, 
he invested in his own startup, getting it off the ground, LinkedIn. But he also was the very first in private investor in uh, in Facebook. He was an uh, early investor in Zynga, the gaming company, along with a number of others. And so, um, so Reed is sort of prototypical angel investor. Make money doing something you like. What is a good use of your time? You know, you don't want to retire, but you want to stay involved. And so you end up uh, investing your own personal money in these in these startups. And that's true. Um, across the country and folks folks have made money in various ways. Um, but there's a new class of uh, investors called uh, what I call professional angels, or here I write VCs masquerading as angels. There are these new venture funds that are sometimes called micro-cap VCs, etc. Uh, groups like first round capital or um, true ventures, etc. Uh, where they're smallish groups. They raised a, a reasonable amount of money. They're going to invest in early, early stage companies. And, uh, and on the one hand, they're going to act like angel investors. They're going, to, they're going to come in early. They're going to bet on individuals with good ideas. Um, but, uh, but they've raised money from a bunch of different people, and they're going to use other people's money to invest in these companies. And so in many ways, they're acting just like venture capitalists. But they're investing super early. Uh, in a person and an idea more than they're investing in a, a particular um, in something that's further down the road and uh, has some revenue traction, etc. Hi, um, David. This is uh, June Chocolate is breaking in. Uh, just wanted to let you know that you're going to need to wrap up in a couple minutes so we can get to the Q and A period for your briefing. Thank you. Okie doke. So the last last source of capital are venture capitalists, and venture capitalists are, uh, as I said, that ultimately we raise some number of millions of dollars from uh, from our investors. Our investors tend to be things like uh, foundations and uh, and uh, universities and uh, nonprofits, etc. And uh, and we take those dollars and we invest them in startups and then uh, and then help help you uh, build big businesses. And so uh, it's really about uh, being professional investors where we're looking to find the right opportunity uh, to trade you know a couple million dollars for some piece of your company and then hope hope to help you grow that business into something bigger. So why don't we hop to the next slide. So just to give you a quick sense of it, what does it take to raise capital? I mean, the answer, uh, I already sort of gave you a sense of it. Um, I say here a great idea, a great team, and a great market. Uh, if I were to emphasize these things in the appropriate, uh, appropriate um, order, it would probably say a great team, a great team, a great team, a great market, a great idea. Uh, maybe you would say a great team, great team, great team, a great idea, great market. But team first. You need great people who are compelling and able to sell and be thoughtful, etc. Um, you need an idea that is differentiated and interesting. Uh, and when I say a great market, what you really need is this opportunity to um, to solve some big problem and that is that is really valuable, right? So. You know, when Facebook got started, it wasn't clear that it was a great market, but, but what is perfectly clear is that when you have 900 million people engaging in a conversation on, online, um, that, there is a, that that's a big market and a big opportunity. So smart people who are pursuing the business, thoughtful technologists, engineers, et cetera, um, maybe you're a restaurateur, maybe you're something, you know, but have, a, have some expertise in the thing that you're building, and then... Um, the ability to build a big business. Uh, why don't we hop to one? The next slide, I think, is that we're almost done. Um, so, what does it cost uh, if you raise money from someone like me? What's the cost to you? Well, the cost are two things. One, you're selling a piece of your company. So, if you uh, raise a million dollars and um, uh, from from a VC and you sell 25% of your company, you know, that's a very clear cost. Uh, you used to have 100% of the company, now you have 75% and the investor has 25%. The other thing that you're giving up is a little bit of control. VCs like to have some say in matters, uh, as do angel investors often. Uh, so you're, you're likely going to need the permission of your investor to sell the company. When you raise more capital, et cetera, you're going to have to have the, you're going to have to go to the investor and have that conversation. So, you know, money is exchanged for ownership and some control over your business. And I think that's the, is there one more slide in there? Uh, what do you get in, in return? Like I say, you get money, you'll get the help of a, of a professional investor, you'll get some validation that you were able to raise money. 
uh, which all of which are good things because I mean it's really hard to build a business and any anything any little piece can help. So that's it. As I say, to VC or not to VC, that is the question. Uh, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. There is a method to this madness, but the method is um, again co comes with a cost, um, and um, it is what you know. Uh, venture investment is a tool, and it's something that you should consider. Or angel investment, or friends and family investment, is a tool, and you should consider it as something that can help accelerate your business. It is not something required, and it is not something you should feel you need to do. But if you do, uh, make sure you're working with the right people who will help you build a big business. Well, thank you, David. Appreciated uh, your remarks. And just wanted to remind everybody that uh, David's uh, full biography is uh, in the uh, package that was sent to you so you could learn a little bit more about his background. Uh, in addition, uh, you know, he brought up a good point that there really isn't one size that fits all for uh, the companies. We have a wide variety of companies that are participating in this uh, transition uh, support program. And this is really just to give you a snapshot of uh, some of the concepts, some of the ideas. And again, it's really up to the businesses to uh, really, uh, you know, vet uh, a lot of the options that are out there to really determine which is the best one that's uh, right for your company. So um, just want to remind everybody, if you have any questions, please type them into, your, uh, in, into the box, and uh, we will um, be able to field a couple to uh, David. Um, I actually have a couple that you know, I've queued up as well. Um, David, one of the things I wanted to ask you is um, we have many companies uh, in this program that have, are developing dual-use technologies. So uh, they have technologies that are applicable to Department of Defense, other federal customers, but also commercial. In terms of a company either presenting before a group of angel uh, capital, uh, uh, angel funders or venture capitalists, um, do you have any recommendations for uh, you know when they're presenting uh, uh, their uh, pitch? Um, you know, is it uh, is it good for them to really uh, showcase the all all the markets that are available to them or to really focus on either commercial market or, say, the defense or other federal market? Well, I think that uh, for any business, focus is important. And so the real question is, you know, and there's this always, always a tension between focus versus scale. Uh, focus is important because it's easier to sell on a, into a focused market. And so if you have a particular expertise or technology particularly well suited to uh, to sell into the federal market, et cetera, then that, you know, that's a, a compelling, reasonable story and, and worth um, and worth telling. On the other hand, there are lots of investors who are looking for big opportunities who want to see the, you know, the idea that, yes, you come out of this market, you've sold in here, but it's actually applicable more broadly and, and, um, and that it's infinitely more valuable if you look at the worldwide market for whatever that thing is. And so it's a little bit of a balancing act. And what I find is that uh, investors who are pitching me say, look, um, we're going to here's our primary market that we're starting with because we understand it best and we and there's a and there's a pull um, here's the broader market that asked after we have gained traction and learning from this particular market we can we can move into these broader sets of markets and and there's a big opportunity that that's um, that's a little bit of a way to have your uh, cake and eat it too and um, and that tends to be successful Thank you. Yeah, the other question we have is uh, do you have any recommendations for how companies can uh, uh, learn more about uh, com competitors, learn about potential uh, market size, you know, basically, uh, you know, how they can actually, um, you know, support doing their market and competitive assessment so that they can build the data that's needed when they go pitch some of these folks. Yeah, I mean, some of that is tricky. Um, I mean, for one thing, I will say for sure the um, the internet is uh, is a powerful thing. I mean, before the ability to sort of use Google and uh, and the web to to find out a bunch of this information, uh, it was it was a really challenging problem. Now I do think that there that there's a huge amount of information available on the web. Uh, some of it is actually the market sizing stuff is a tricky one. Always always hard to find, and there are lots of analysts that are looking at these sorts of markets and what I find is the best way to get to that information is to go to to the best available library and particularly if you're near a university and you can get access to that university they tend to have uh, licenses to these to these um, research groups that that uh, collect up data about markets 
but oftentimes market sizing is reported either is reported secondhand. Here's what Forrester says is the market size, and then you can uh, and then you can point to that, or you have to or you have to see if you can find resources who can get to these particular reports in the first instance. Now, obviously, around here we have several business schools, and those are the, those are great opportunities. And frankly. Uh, working with students is always helpful. I mean, there are lots of opportunities to reach out to students to say, you know, I'm working on this business and I'd love to have your help on thinking through market size, et cetera, and then get them to work on this question because they have better resources in many respects than, uh, than the average entrepreneur does. Okay, thank you, David. Really appreciate uh, you taking the time to present today, and uh, we look forward to um, hearing more about uh, your activities in the future. All right, thanks very much. Thank you.